Good evening. Welcome to tonight's Voices of Social Change lecture. My name is Maran Tespe, and I am honored to stand before you this evening to introduce our Voices of Social Change guest speaker, Dr. Cornell West. Voices of Social Change is a program sponsored by the Office of Leadership and Community Service Learning and the Adele H. Stamp Student Union Center for Campus Life. The Voices Speaker Series honors local and national leaders by bringing them to campus to discuss social issues with Maryland students and to help them discover ways in which they can engage in positive social change. Dr. West is one of the most prominent voices of social change in the United States. Tonight's event is acknowledged as a fearless ideas event. Dr. West embodies the values of the fearless ideas campaign and works to bring about transformational change. That is why many in the University of Maryland community have been involved in bringing him to campus. At this time, I would like to say a few words of gratitude to those who have supported us. I would like to say a, a special thanks to Drury G. Bagwell Omicron Delta Kappa Leadership Lecture Program for their generous contribution. Please join me in acknowledging Dr. Bagwell, who's here tonight in the audience. I would also like to thank the School of Public Policy, Honors College, W.E.B. Du Bois Honors Society, Office of Diversity, Education and Compliance, the President's Commission on Ethnic Minority Issues, College of Arts and Humanities, Office of Multicultural Involvement and Community Advocacy, Department of Residential Life, Office of Multi-Ethnic Students Education, Numburu Cultural Center, Office of Community Engagement, the Pepsi Fund, and Student Entertainment Events. This event would not have been possible without their support. Please join me in acknowledging them at this time. <laughs> Dr. Cornell West is a professor of philosophy and Christian practice at Union Theological Seminary and Professor Emeritus at Princeton University. He has also taught at Yale University, Harvard University, and University of Paris. He has written 20 books and has edited an additional 13 books. You may have read his classics like Race Matters, Democracy Matters, or his most recent book, The Rich and the Rest of Us, co-authored with Tavis Smiley. You may also recognize him from some of your favorite TV shows like Real Time with Bill Maher, The Colbert Report, CNN, C-SPAN, and Ta Tavis Smiley's PBS TV show. He's an activist for racial equality a voice for the poor, and a tireless advocate for democracy. We are honored to have him here with us tonight. There will be a question and answer period following his lecture, so I ask that you please hold your questions till the end. I 
also ask that you don't use any personal photography or video recording. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Cornell West. Thank you so very much. What a blessing to be at University of Maryland College Park. Oh, yes. Terrapins, big turtle. What an honor, what a delight to be here. Those kind and generous words from my dear sister, Maran. She's part, of course, of the wonderful voices of social change. My very dear brother, Mark. Sister Diana, and the others who've worked so very hard to bring us all together. I want to salute, of course, Brother Craig of the Leadership and Community Service Learning. I want to salute the captain of the ship, your president, Wallace Lowe. Give Brother Wallace a hand. Give Brother Wallace a hand. Dear Brother Bagwell, thank you so much. Give, give Brother Bagwell another hand. Give him another hand. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. <laughs> I want to acknowledge uh, the faculty at the University of Maryland, high quality faculty. And I'm thinking of people like Professor Patricia Hill Collins, who's played ma major, major contribution. Professor Harold Waterman as well. Give Professor Waterman a hand as well. Thank you so very much. Thank each and every one of you for coming out. Last but not least, I want to thank a freedom fighter in your midst. His name is Brother Solomon Commission. Where is Brother Solomon? Where is Brother Solomon? Stand up, brother. Stand up, brother. He's in love with justice. Indeed, indeed, he's in love with justice. My dear friend Glenn Ford of Black Agenda Report and Bruce Dixon and others, very important voices of our day. Uh, as you can see, I'm in no rush. I'm not, uh, we're going to take our time this evening. I, I'm a man of the spirit. Calendar time means nothing at all. We're going to try to wrestle with some issues. I also know, of course, of the incident that took place uh, here, the, the homicide and the suicide. I'm told there's going to be a vigil. Is that right? Right after our our gathering. I hope you all do have time to join. Maybe we should just have a moment of silence. Would that, would that be appropriate? Is that all right? Let's just have a moment of silence for uh, our brothers and sisters. Each life so precious, so priceless. No matter what color, no matter what gender, no matter what sexual orientation, no matter what civilization, human beings Yes, indeed, I was just blessed to be in, in Dean Wood in Washington, D.C. on 44th Street, the house of the one and only Marvin Gaye. It's a house with just about two and a half or three rooms. It produced a titan of love. Not just a musician, but somebody who had the courage to dig deep in the dark precincts of his own soul and lift his voice. He was a voice for social change. If you take seriously his classic of the spring of 1971, what's going on? Save the babies. Who really cares? It's an echo of Donny Hathaway and Roberta Flack, where he is. The love. Anytime you talk about social change, you're not talking about abstractions. You're talking about what kind of human being will you choose to be. You're trying to take seriously line 38A of Plato's Apology. The unexamined life is not worth living. Malcolm X would always add, the examined life is painful. 
See, my dear sister Angel right here, the graduate student. Give her a hand, sister Angel. Just raise your hand, raise your hand. Brilliant, there you go, brilliant graduate student. Angel Love Mile, part of the same tradition. I could already feel her spirit when she walked in, and she walked with dignity in her chair. Physically challenged, but a giant when it comes to heart, mind, and soul. What kind of human being are you going to be? We know our English word human derives from Armando. Armando means what? Burial. What means toward burial, toward death. When you wrestle with the question, what does it mean to be a featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creature born between yearn and feces? That's who we are. That's why I spend so much time with funk masters like Bootsy Collins and George Clinton. Because they remind each and every one of us we all emerge in the funk of our mother's wombs. And it's bloody down there. It's funky down there. But there's a lot of love down there. And no one of us would be here if they did not have the courage of that love push that got us out. And one day very soon, our bodies will be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. That's funky, too. You're not here that long. And in our market-driven culture, so obsessed with titillation and stimulation, so obsessed with love of money and love of pleasure and love of position and love of wealth, we don't get a chance to wrestle with the question of what it means to be human. What kind of virtues, what kind of values, what kind of visions will be manifest in your short move from your mama's womb the tomb. That's why I always begin my presentation saying quite unapologetically, the greatest honor I have ever had in my life is to be the second son of the late Clifton West and Irene West and the brother of Clifton and Cynthia and Cheryl. Because it was in that context where story begins, narrative begins. It begins with something concrete, something you can touch something you can feel. And I come from a tradition where it's not just about ideas. Yes, arguments play a role, but it's also how you feel. How do you stay in motion? I'm talking about the love train that Curtis Mayfield was singing about when he said, people get ready. Hope is about motion and movement, somehow being able to muster fortitude and determination and strength because of a decency and an integrity and a magnanimity. That's where I come from. That's why I was so moved by being in Deanwood. That's why I, Deanwood, that's why I was so moved today to be with the magnificent Dorothy Deckett Ross, the mother of my dear brother Raymond Ross, who just lost her beloved husband, one of the great figures that I've met in my life, Brother Charles Ross, Jr., just a few weeks ago. When you're talking about social change, you're talking about history, you're beginning with human beings who stood up and straightened their backs up and stood with dignity. And echo line 24a of Plato's Apology, where Socrates says, the cause of my unpopularity is parhesia. Parhesia means what? Fearless speech, frank speech, Plain speech, unintimidated speech, being willing to speak from the depths of your soul, be it a Marvin Gaye or a Nina Simone, be it a Bruce Springsteen on the vanilla side of town. Oh, he's a blues man on the vanilla side of town. Or Bob Dylan on the Jewish side of town. Our dear blues man, Bob Dylan, mustering the courage to speak what is inside of him and share it, not because he thinks he has a monopoly on truth, but because he wants to share it in public space. So maybe he can touch somebody's heart, mind, and soul, and body to be more courageous and more compassionate. And this is so very important in our day because we live under the rule of money, especially big money, which means everybody's for sale and everything is for sale. 
And I didn't have to deal with that at the level of intensity that my young brothers and sisters of all colors do today. I grew up in the 1960s. Oh, what a glorious time. Oh, yes. And I'm not going to walk down memory lane, but it is part of my story. That when I was coming along on the chocolate side of town in Sacramento, California, shaped by Reverend Willie P. Cook of Shiloh Baptist Church, who spent more time on the roof oftentimes than he did in the church because he was working on the building fund to make sure he didn't have to pay money to keep his prison ministry alive. Not too many preachers like that today, huh? Oh, no, we got mega churches with mega money, but not a lot of mega courage, not a lot of mega love, not a lot of mega justice. It's about cash, cash, cash. Cash rules everything around me, Wu-Tang says, but doesn't have to rule me. I didn't have to deal with that when I was growing up. I heard Martin Luther King Jr. speak when I was 10 years old. The brother moved me. I didn't understand fully what he was talking about, but one thing I knew, he was for real. Didn't have to listen to Ashford and Simpson. He said, give me something real that won't fade in the light of day. He was the real thing. Not because he had a monopoly on truth, but because he was willing to live and die for something bigger than him. Fannie Lou Hamer. Earlier today, I met a brother who was close to Rat Brown. He's here in the audience, sending me a, a message from the prison. Here he is over here, my dear brother. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. We had Stokely Carmichael. We had Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Great prophetic figure. We had Dorothy Day, white Catholic sister. Norman Thomas was still alive. Norman Thomas, one of the grand figures of the 20th century. Princeton, Union Theological Seminary, highly sophisticated and subtle, willing to live and die for the least of these. And he was post-Christian. He was a lapsed Christian. He lost his Christian faith in the struggle for social change. That happens sometimes. Hasn't happened to me, but that happens sometimes like in the case of the great Norman Thomas. In fact, when Martin Luther King Jr. received a call to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, he said, no, give it to Norman Thomas first before you give it to me. Oh, we don't like to talk about that connection. Brother Martin, Brother Norman. But young people, thank God we have an increasing and escalating hunger and thirst for love of justice and love of neighbor. Love of orphan and love of widow, love of fatherless and motherless, love of the weak and vulnerable. Because that kind of love cuts so radically against the grain under the rule of money. It is much more difficult to engage in the process of what the Greeks call paideia, which is fundamental to my own story, P-A-I-D-E-I-A, -E paideia, which is Deep education, not cheap schooling. And I know you're here at the University of Maryland College Park for Paideia. Deep education, not cheap schooling. You didn't come here just to gain access to a skill so you can, gain, you, you can get a dynamite job and live in some vanilla suburb. No, I know the students here didn't do. No, you came here for some soul wrestling, what it means to be a human being, what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be wrestling with public interest and common good. Is that right? Is that right? I believe you. But I know it's a tension, a deep tension, because of course I do want you to get a, a job with a living wage. Wouldn't it be nice if everybody had a job with a living wage? Here at University of Maryland, <laughs> Princeton, Harvard, every hood and neighborhood. The president talked the other day about raising the minimum wage. Magnificent, Brother Ralph Nader and others have been talking about for a while. Magnificent, work and steal poor, it ought to be oxymoronic, it ought to be contradictory, you see. But it isn't an art. 25% of the jobs in America work and steal poor. 1% of the population still own 42% of the wealth, the top 400 individuals still have wealth equivalent to the bottom 150 million. That's key sweat moments, something, something just ain't right. <laughs> something, something is deeply Wrong. So how do you generate Socratic energy? 
muster the courage to think critically, first beginning with yourself. We're not talking about name calling or finger pointing. Not what social change is all about. You begin with yourself, because when you begin with yourself, you recognize what history has deposited inside of you. I look at myself, I've still got white supremacy inside of me, been struggling against it for 59 years. That's when my white brothers and sisters come to me and say, Professor West, I've transcended race. I no longer have prejudice. I like to look everybody in such a way that I'm colorblind. I say, well, I've got white supremacy in me. Check yourself. Check yourself. No one of us pure or pristine. We're on an endless and incessant struggle. I got male supremacy inside of me. But I've been learning from Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and Adrian Rich all my life. I've got too much American imperialist sensibility in me. I can't stand the idea that American baby has more weight than a baby in Pakistan or Somalia or Yemen or Ethiopia or Brazil or Venezuela. I got to work that out. I've got to work it out. The anti-Semitism inside of me, I'm a Christian. No such thing as a Christian civilization is not shot through with elements of hatred of Jewish brothers and sisters. But you need to die. That needs you try to kill that. Kill the anti-Muslim sensibility so pervasive in American culture. Anti-Arab, pervasive in American culture. And don't think just because you read one text you transcended it. No, you've been shaped and molded in the bowels of American civilization that has these forms of xenophobia working consciously and unconsciously. That's why in a context of struggle, that's where you learn how to push it back. That's why students enter my classes, I tell them, I'm so glad you're here. You're coming here to learn how to die. It's, I thought I was just coming here to read some text and get a grade. No, 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 no. You're going to learn how to die here. <laughs> Plato says what? Philosophy is a meditation on and preparation for death, but not just death as an event. Montaigne, probably the finest of all European philosophers in early Europe, what I say, called to philosophize is to learn how to die. To be a seeker of wisdom, a lover of wisdom, is to learn how to die. Seneca says, he or she who learns how to die unlearns slavery. There's a direct connection between mustering the courage to learn how to die and being free in your mind, heart, and soul. Because any time you let go of an assumption or presupposition, any time you give up an, a prejudice or a prejudgment, that's a form of death. And there's no learning. There's no maturation. There's no development without death for rebirth. Death for expanding. I'm told May 19th there's going to be a graduation somewhere. Is that right, University of Maryland? You're going to have a celebratory day. Is that right? And the seniors will look back and say, oh, my God, as a freshman, I came in with my own parochialism and provincialism, but at the University of Maryland, I learned how to die. I'm more mature. I'm stronger. I'm more open-minded. I'm willing to examine and scrutinize my assumptions and presuppositions. Some of the dogmas that I had had to go. And I'm not just talking about the dogmas of white supremacy or male supremacy or anti-Semitism or anti-Arab or anti-Muslim sensibilities or homophobia or class privilege, or imperial status. But those are some of the dogmas that must be thoroughly questioned in that process of learning how to die so that you then enter space where you're willing not just to think, but to do, not just to do, but to be, to be a certain kind of Socratic figure, a certain kind of questioning figure non-conformist in the face of conformity, courage in the face of cowardice, and on fire in the face of just being a theorist of the flame. When you are in a context of social change, you need to be able 
to be both Socratic and situate yourself in a story and locate yourself in a narrative that's bigger than you, which means you need to accent the three dimensions of time, past, present, and future. But here again, we live in a society where more and more memory is lost. That's why I love the Sankofa bird. Sankofa bird is what? Refusing to move forward until you first look backwards to be connected with the best of the past. Like being a jazz musician and knowing nothing about Louis Armstrong or Sarah Vaughan or John Coltrane or Theolonius Monk. What music are you playing? I got something new. Okay, play. <laughs> How you think you gonna sound in the tradition of jazz when you never in contact with those voices. How you gonna talk about social change when you haven't studied W.B. Du Bois? And you haven't wrestled with C. Wright Mills? And you never heard who William Appleton Williams actually is when he talks about American life linked to empire? So that tension between America being a precious experiment in democracy on the one hand and an adventure in empire on the other. So you can get outside of your own bubble and look at the world not simply from the vantage point of what you're used to, but from the vantage point of indigenous people. They don't need to be in the room for us to be hypersensitive to not only their suffering, but their resistance. 1492, World War I began, been going on ever since from their vantage point. How could that be true? Look at the indigenous people's plight and then look at the U.S. Constitution. Savages, dispossessed land, dispossessed babies, women, children. Oh, Brother West, that's too far back. We're talking about 2013. Past, present, and future. Yes, things have changed before in a variety of different ways precisely because there's been courageous human beings and courageous citizens who were willing to engage critically and courageously to change things. Like I remember the first interaction I had with my dear brother Barack Obama. He gave a speech in Boston. He said, America is a magical place. And I went on TV the next day and said, this brother's gonna have a Christopher Columbus experience. <laughs> He's gonna discover America. America is free and democratic to the degree to which every generation there's been courageous people willing to keep it as free and democratic as people can do relative to how much they are willing to sacrifice. And America will lose its freedom and democracy if we produce a generation that is so conformist, so complacent, and so cowardly that we're obsessed with just money and pleasure and lose any commitment to justice. Any commitment to justice. We're not on automatic. We're not on automatic. Every generation must respond to its own set of crises and challenges. My generation was what? Crime against humanity called Jim and Jane Crow was American terrorism. Every two and a half days for over 55 years, some black body was swinging from a tree. The strange fruit the southern trees bear that the great Billy Holiday sang about and the Jewish brother Maripol writing the lyrics. You all know that song, Strange Fruit. Crime against humanity. We had to deal with carpet bombing in Vietnam. Those were war crimes. Anytime you kill innocent people let alone by the thousands. I'm not a pacifist like Brother Martin. I believe in just war. I would have fought against the Nazis. Even in the Jim Crow Army, I would have fought against the gangster named Hitler. He wanted to dominate the world. Got to fight. I would have fought with Nelson Mandela against apartheid. I'm a soldier, Christian, but a warrior. But it has to be very special conditions under which I engage in that kind of war. For the most part, I opt for nonviolent. 
wars against poverty, against injustice, against losing sight of the humanity of other people, you see. But we also had the challenge of poverty. Then, his brother Michael Harrington, we'll never forget him, the other America, classic, 23% of Americans living in poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world. 1962, we look 51 years later, what do we have? Well, we broke the back of Jim Crow Sr. Still got Jim Crow Jr. Prison Industrial Complex. 300,000 incarcerated in 1971. Now we got 2.4 million, 62% of them incarcerated owing to soft drug offenses. Murders and rapists, got to go. Got to go. Soft drugs, 62%. 13% of black youth flying high in the friendly sky every week. Drug addiction. White youth, 13%. 65% of those convicted, black. A tilt toward the chocolate side of town. A tilt toward the poor. So that mass incarceration is in many ways class incarceration because of the war on drugs targeting poor people. And we spent nearly a trillion dollars. We have spent a Marshall Plan on jails and prisons, but when it comes to education of, of quality, when it comes to jobs with a living wage, when it comes to decent housing, we can't find a penny. We can't find a penny. That's warped priority. And let's just be honest about it. Given the fact that the world economy was nearly destroyed just a few years ago, owing to, in part, not primarily greed, market manipulation, insider trading, predatory lending, fraudulent accounting. Not one executive of a Wall Street bank is yet to go to jail. But let Jamal get caught with a crack bag and in the hood. He's off to jail for six years, seven years, nine years. Even under the SNL crisis, we had 1,100 bankers went to jail. Why is it that we have a criminal justice system tilted in such a way that those at the top are protected? Some of them dining at the White House. People say, Brother West, how come you always so hard on Brother Barack Obama? I love the brother. I'm a Christian. I love everybody. But when you tilt toward Wall Street rather than Main Street and bail out banks rather than homeowners, when big banks can get relatively interest-free loans, but students have to pay interest high, too high interest on loans, somebody's got to say something. When 16% of Americans and 23% of children of all colors still live in poverty in 2013 in the richest nation of the history of the world that is a disgrace. It's morally obscene and spiritually profane. And yet where's the moral outrage? The voices of social change say, we are concerned, we care. We're willing to lift our voices. We're willing to be honest and consistent. What the great Jane Austen called constancy, which is a commitment to integrity. So that when our young people are shot down in such a way that it brings tears to your eyes, be Newtown, Connecticut, to be the south side of Chicago. In fact, I was just in Chicago this, this weekend. I spoke at St. Sabina, Reverend, Reverend Flager's church, and I looked on the front row, and there was Brother Nathaniel, who was the father of Precious Hadiyah Pendleton. You all know Sister Hadiyah. 
funeral just took place this weekend, Saturday. Sister Michelle Obama was kind enough to go. And I had him step up to the lectern. And he stood there. And he talked about his daughter. He talked about his wife, Cleopatra. And he did it with a level of decency and dignity that brought tears to everyone's eyes. And I told the crowd then, I said, you've come to hear me talk about black history. You have seen black history in his words because the history of black people in America at our best is a history that looks terrorism in the face but refuses to terrorize others but wants freedom for everybody. That's Frederick Douglass. That is Harriet Tubman. That's Sojourner Truth. And that the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. But you take a higher moral and spiritual ground. And that's what you saw with Nathaniel. He didn't talk about hating anybody. He knows hatred is the coward's revenge against those who intimidate you. Hatred is always a form of cowardice. He refused to stay in the gutter, even though his own baby had been shot, in this case, by a black man. And I talked about Emma Teal's mother. When she stepped to the lectern in August of 1955 in Chicago and said, I don't have a minute to hate. I will pursue justice for the rest of my life. And Emma Till's mother's daughter just happened to be in the fourth row. She just raised her hand and said, Brother West, you talking about my mama? I said, stand up. Stand up. We got another grand example of black history, American history, human history, that in the face of exploitation, and domination, the commitment is to justice, freedom, democracy for everybody, not just Americans. Which means even when we talk about the death of children, we ought to be just as concerned about children in America as we are the 436 children who were killed in January 2008 with the massacre in Gaza. 1,400 human beings killed. That a life in Gaza has the exact same status as a precious life in Tel Aviv. That our Jewish brothers and sisters are precious. Our Palestinian brothers and sisters are precious. And we don't care what US foreign policy is. If you're going to be a voice for social change, you got to tell the truth. And you have to be able to build the consequences. Children in El Salvador, children in Brazil. Well, Brother West, we can't keep up on everybody. I can hardly keep track of what's going on in my neighborhood. I understand. I can't keep track of everything either. But I'm talking about what's in your heart, mind, and soul, and what motivates you to be a voice for social change. What kind of story really it constitutes the win at your back? So if you knew of what's going on, what the Chinese are doing in Tibet, what Morocco's doing in sub Sahara, occupation, subordination, what's going on in so many other parts of the world concerned with what the great Franz Fanon called the wretched of the earth. No, we can't be on top of everything, but if we could, would you still have the same larger universal concern and cosmopolitan sensibility so that every life significance and value and when you fundamentally believe that you're willing then to take seriously the Negro national anthem which is not lift every echo is lift every voice to become an agent for social change I spent a lot of time in the studio with hip-hop artists been blessed to work with giants like KRS-One and Khalid Kweli and Brother Ali and Immortal Technique. And each time I enter the studio, I always tell them, you all know I'm old school. And what I bring with me is old school. It could be Bob Marley. It could be Luther Vandross. It could be Aretha Franklin, Gladys Knight. They were original. Among the younger generation, too many copies. Too many imitations. 
looking at everybody else to see how, what to wear, how to think, how to fit in. And in part because in the last 30 years, it's the class war from the top against poor and working people, the massive shift of wealth from poor and working people to the well-to-do is not just by means of taxes, it's by means of the structure at the workplace, by a tax on unions, trade unions, teachers unions, unions across the board, minimizing the power of workers to engage in the kind of collective bargaining so when profits go up, the wages go up, as was the case between 1945 and 1973. Tell the young folk, so if you're going to get beyond just being a copy, if you're going to really lift your voice, you see, you're going to have to pay a price. For almost 35 years, young people have been told the end and aim of your life is to be successful. And I can't stand that. Because I was never told that, not one time in my life to be successful, never. I was told to be great. As a Christian, I was told to be faithful, not successful. And greatness is defined in terms of what is the quality of your service to others, what courage you have, what is the quality of your compassion for the weak and the vulnerable. That's why Alexander the Great doesn't impress me. Alexander the Conqueror. Alexander the Dominator, Alexander the Imperialist. I'm not impressed by dominating the world. That's why I'm fighting against Hitler. I'm impressed with greatness. Amos, Jesus, Mohammed, Martin King, Dorothy Day. That's greatness. And it's so difficult these days to talk about greatness to young people, not young folk in this audience, but I'm talking about young folk in other parts of the country. Because the end and aim is to be not only somebody, but to make it large. Because you're living in a culture of superficial spectacle where everybody wants to be at the center of things. a celebrity craze culture just to be on television, just to be visible even for a moment as if that prefigures your immortality. And yet Malcolm X was shot down. He only had a hundred and some dollars in his pocket. That's all he owned. And yet they'll be talking about Malcolm X as long as there's a notion of freedom in the world. Martin Luther King Jr. shot down, didn't have money, pay for insurance for his four children. If it wasn't for Harry Belafonte, they wouldn't have had insurance. Every penny from the Nobel Peace Prize of Brother Martin given to the movement. You can imagine Coretta saying, Martin, you're going too far now, brother. Let's break this thing down. Come on now. Put about 50%, 45, 45, 45. Did you get my point? That is extreme, but they set the standards. It's like John Coltrane blowing 18 hours, hours going to bed with the horn in his mouth and wake up blowing. Now, if you want to be a saxophone player, you don't have to go that far, but you get the point. Kenny G, do you get the point? Practice, 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 discipline, 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 sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Following that way, it doesn't necessarily produce narrow conceptions of success. And this obsession with success leads toward an addiction to not just publicity and visibility, but if you fail, other forms of addiction, sexual addiction, drug addiction, and all the other forms of addiction that numb the soul. And the end result of such success is what? Too many young brothers and sisters of all colors well adjusted to injustice, but successful. The opposite of what I learned when I was growing up, they would say, you see that brother over there? He's doing very well, he got big money, but no deep sense of service, not willing to help anybody, we look down on it not walking around as some hero because he got a lot of money. Something's wrong with the brother. He's suffering from spiritual malnutrition or moral constipation, something. 
Something's not flowing. <laughs> Something's getting in the way. Greed, avarice, envy, jealousy, something is getting in the way. And we need that spirit back. That's what it means to resurrect the spirit of Martin King, to resurrect the spirit of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, to resurrect the spirit of Dorothy Day. And young folk need that connection, not in the interest of imitation. There'll never be another Martin King or Curtis Mayfield, never at all. But one can learn from them. And in lifting your young voices for social change, you become part of that love train, part of that tradition committed to justice, beginning with looking at the world through the lens of poor people, working people, women, our gay brothers, our lesbian sisters, our Muslim brothers, our Arab brothers and sisters, especially in the States, but global. That's how you generate a renaissance of compassion tied to being a militant for sweetness and a radical for gentleness, subversive for what Otis Redden called tenderness. See, love is what justice looks like in public. But any justice that's only justice soon degenerates into something less than justice. Justice is rescued only by something deeper than justice, namely love. And I speak quite explicitly in public and private about love, just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. And I remind young folk, it's not say my name, say my name, say my name, it's try a little tenderness. Serious. You can't be a voice for justice in public if in private you're still a dominator. You can't be a major voice for justice in public if in private you're still a manipulator. Did against women by the brothers. And this is true with our gay brothers and lesbian sisters. You can, you can be gay and still manipulate each other because you're still human beings. You can be lesbian and still manipulate each other. You're still human beings. Where is your tenderness? Where is your sweetness? It ought to be on a continuum with your commitment to justice in public. And when you get that kind of renaissance, then you got something. Now, is it the case that America has a capacity for it? That's an open question. We just could be living in an empire that is in deep decay, in decline. We look at Congress, we don't see ideal activity obsessed with public interest, do we? Not at all. Pettiness. Too much legalized bribery and normalized corruption tied to lobbyists on K Street. Now, this is not true for all the politicians, but it embraces too many of them. Turn to the courts. Do we see enough justice? Not enough. Turn to the White House, executive power, National Defense Authorization Act. President now has the power to not just detain but assassinate American citizens with no due process, no judicial process, no accountability, no answerability whatsoever. And everybody knows if that happened under George Bush, there would be major marches on, in the front of the White House every week. Every week. Because it's wrong. Because it's unjust. How's it happening under Obama? Well, he got that beautiful smile. <laughs> He's charming, brilliant, charismatic, and black. And anytime you drop blackness into the discourse, people get a little ill at ease. Well, he's got the deep uh, Martin Luther King uh, elements in him. It just hasn't been manifest. Well, we're waiting. Didn't mention the Palestinians yesterday at all. Come on, Brother Barack. How could you not mention the Palestinians? Not even mention their name. <laughs> Occupation is wrong. If the Palestinians were, were occupying our precious Jewish brothers and sisters, we ought to have major marches against Palestinian occupation against Jews. Because it's wrong. I don't care who occupies. 
If it's Jewish, Israeli occupation of Palestinians, we ought to be just as upset as if it was Palestinian occupation of Jews. Both are precious, as I said. How you going to talk about the problem and can't talk about both sides? That's the kind of critical engagement we need. And I think it is increasing and escalating. Why? Because as Malcolm used to say, chickens come home to roost, y'all. You're going to reap what you sow. You can't just keep killing innocent folk and don't think that it doesn't affect your soul. The bombs that are dropped by drones in Pakistan, they land in Washington, D.C., too. From money spent on military, that not spent on housing, not spent on education, not spent on jobs with a living wage, but there's also a spiritual dimension. You can't continually have that kind of moral numbness in treating fellow human beings in that way and think there's no blowback in the soul of your nation. And people say, well, Brother West, America lost its soul 150 years ago. And some folk believe that. I don't believe it, not because I'm naive, but because as long as there's groups like Voices for Change at University of Maryland College Park, it means we are committed to trying to ensure that the nation has soul, that our human family has soul, and keep in mind soul is a sharing of sweetness against the backdrop of catastrophe. That's what soul music is. If you're getting down and out and feeling as if you're so cold-hearted and mean-spirited, you put on a little soul music and let that love from the Isley Brothers get inside of your soul and give you a sense of warmth and embrace something bigger than you. That's what I'm talking about. I salute the voices. Social change. Thank you so very much for having me. Let's have dialogue. Thank you so very much for being so patient. We have question and answer and commentary. Thank you so very much. Please do not hesitate. Any queries, questions? Yes. Good evening, Dr. West. Indeed, speak right in that microphone so we can all hear you. Your wonderful you voice. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, yes, Valentine's Indeed. Day today, too. Well, I'm glad you reminded me. I got to make a phone call. No, go right in. <laughs> I bet you got a lot of calls to make. <laughs> Anyways, um, so you said that it is up to each generation to confront their own crises. Well, sir, a few friends and I started an organization right here at the University of Maryland to serve that very purpose, the United Youth Movement, which intends to uh, to discuss marginalized issues that involve uh, politics and society overall. <clears throat> the problem here at the University of Maryland is the, the docility that's found here um, that comes with uh, the political labels, such as you know, having um, President Barack Obama in office and him passing the NDAA, him committing these atrocities overseas, him putting all these drone bases in Africa, yeah, things yeah. that President Bush never imagined he could do. Now I'm saying, how could we get the student population here, the liberals, the, the individuals, everybody, doesn't matter, disregarding the political labels, how do we get people galvanized? How do we muster that support to yeah. create that change that you're speaking of? Well, one, you're doing the right thing in terms of not only lifting voices, but organizing and mobilizing. Thank you want to make sure that your visions are heard, but keep in mind, it's always going to be not only messy, but it's going to be jazz-like. It's going to be improvisational. I'll give you an example. That Brother Tavis Smiley and I, we had on our radio show Ron Paul, who will be heard this weekend. Libertarian. There's a lot of things I agree with that brother. Rights, liberties, suspicion of Patriotic Act, indictment of the National Defense Authorization Act, deeply concerned about the expansion of executive power, concerned about precisely those things you talked about in terms of foreign policy. Now, when it comes to economics, we clashed lovingly, intensely. I thought he was wrong. He thought I was wrong. We fought it out. But when it comes to issues of, for example, civil liberties, 
you come together with libertarians. You say, you know what, as human beings, as fellow citizens, we disagree on these issues, but when it comes to Guantanamo, when it comes to a host of other issues, we can work together. Never looking for purity. Remember I said before, no one of us pure and pristine. You see what I mean? Uh, and, 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 and that way, things can expand, usually in an unpredictable way. We, we're surprised in terms of the kind of coalitions we find ourselves. Now, for example, if you have a critique of corporate power that does not call for a limited government the way Brother Ron Paul does, he has a critique of corporate power, but he wants limited government. In fact, I asked him, I said, you know, Brother Ron, why are you so suspicious of democracy? You love liberty. He says, yes, I have a deep suspicion of democracy. Well, that's why I'm a deep Democrat with libertarian sensibilities, and you're a deep libertarian with a small dose of democracy. So we overlap on certain issues, and we depart on others. Same process at work in terms of creating social change on these various issues. But the ecological catastrophe that is impending for your generation is something that is much more in the face than it was for mine. And this is something that must be accented as well. Do you want to just jump in and say one yeah, quick thing? Yeah, um, we already work with the libertarians. How do we get everybody else in? Oh, <laughs> well, keep in mind, though, you're not going to get everybody. <laughs> and not only that, but you... This room would be fine. Let's yeah, get but, this room. No, no, but, but in the way, as I said before, though, in the end, it's not about quantity. It's about quality. See, Martin King called for a boycott in Montgomery to over 100 churches in Montgomery. How many churches joined Martin? 17. If he had waited for every church, never would have moved. You just want to make sure you got high quality persons of character, willingness to have integrity to move forward. I made the joke about me mega churches. It's better to have a small church with 150 with folk on fire for justice than to have 15,000, all of them lukewarm, looking for the next Lexus and ben Bentley. You see what I mean? Keep that quality. Keep that stress on quality. Yes, indeed. Oh, that's Hi, brother uh, West. Thank you for your talk. Um, as you know, my name's Angel, and my question, um, you brought up a lot of systems of oppression, and so I wanted to bring up a system that people are less familiar with, which is ableism, which is the idea that people with disabilities are inferior to people without disabilities, and people don't really think about that because they think, you know, when we see the, the media, you see people being kind of disabled people, giving them flowers, and money and stuff like that. But in structurally, uh, people with disabilities are treated really heinously. We're 80% unemployed. So you can't talk about poverty without talking about disabled people. You can't talk about the, the prison industrial complex without talking about disabled people because we're overrepresented in the prisons. Every, every structure of inequality really intersects with disabled people. Um, but we're not talked about enough. And I think it's really important. I just wanted to bring that up to this audience um, because I think that we're in a position to do something about it, and I don't think that our campus does enough. Um, and me, as one of the few disabled people, it's like a burden that, that's been put on me, and I can't do it by myself. And I think that um, disability is an example of how um, interdependent we all are, because the pressure of disabled people can't be eradicated literally without able-bodied people caring. I cannot get a ramp unless able-bodied people build it. It's just not possible. Right? So I'm literally dependent on the very group that oppresses me. Like, and that is the conundrum or whatever. And so I just wanted to bring that up because I know you're aware of it. But I also wanted to bring it up to this audience to try to work with um, me and other students to try to make um, the campus and our larger community more accessible to everyone, especially um, people with disabilities. Eloquent, eloquent. And I just want to add this, my dear sister. And Sister Angel, Sister Angel, tell me, tell me what you think about what I have to say. Because you are eloquent. That, and I'm thinking especially what it means to come out of the black freedom movement. The black freedom movement has never been a movement concerned only about black people. That's why I can't stand the slogan of the Black Congressional Caucus. We have no permanent friends, no f permanent enemies, only permanent interests. No, 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 we're more than just people with interests. We have principles. We're committed to fairness. And once we reach the point where all we have in a society are just interest groups, then it sucks out the moral content. And there's little talk about fairness and justice. It's just about what my interests are. And then you have to be a member of that group to even highlight it. So when you talked about 
ableism and the degree to which we're talking about issues of justice and fairness and people who are more able must be committed to those who are less able in certain ways, not, not in all ways, but in certain ways, then you're talking about a moral dimension. You're talking about a spiritual dimension. And that's crucial. Same is true with our Latino brothers and sisters. It's almost as if, well, now we have to talk about immigration because they voted so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and there's more Latinos than there are black folks. No, we should have been concerned about Latinos from the very beginning based on moral grounds. What is just? What is a just immigration policy? What's a highly principled immigration policy? We don't have to wait until the Republican Party feels itself in crisis because they didn't get the Latino vote and the Democrats have to wait because they got the Latino vote. That's all that narrow Machiavellian politics only about interest. Now, of course, we all have interests. We all have interests as individuals and as groups. But if we reduce our politics simply the Hobbesian calculus of the reflection about whose interest is X or Y, then we lose that question that I started with. What kind of human being are you going to be at the moral and spiritual level? And I, and, and, and I think you are able to accent that even as you highlight a group that is often invisible in both our discourse and our practice. I agree. I just want to say quickly that an example of um, the invisibility of disability is the the, the fact that the Senate didn't ratify the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabilities, like there was like no good reason for that. And there was no public outrage about it. Like, it, and I, I just think that that is so unjust because it would have, it would not have hurt our nation. Like just to sign and say that we agree that other nations should have the same rights and same access to disability services as any other nation, but still our, our country, our Senate, even when other Republicans asked them, like, hey, you know, um, like uh, McCain and others said, hey, you should sign this, they did not. So that's how deep-seated um, ableism is, and that's how, like, how invisible it is, because people aren't outraged about it, and they should be, because disability can happen to anybody, so you should think about and it. And I think part of it has to do with our corporate media, where the information not even made available. People hardly even know about the United Nations thing. You got Fox News, echo chamber for the Republican Party, MSNBC, echo chamber for the Democrats and the Obama administration. Where's the critical reflection? Journalism is not some extension of a party. Journalism is critical engagement to ask unsettling questions. Thank God for democracy now. Thank God for Black Agenda Report. Thank God for Counterpunch. Thank God for Common Dreams. Trying to raise these larger issues. Because a lot of people probably didn't even, how many people even knew about what our dear sister is talking about? Oh, this, this is a highly informed group. But, but I know a lot of people never heard of it before, but I'm sorry. You got wonderful patience, brother. Just go right ahead. Brother West, first and foremost, I want to thank you, Kurt, for coming out today and uh, mentioning some of the things that you do. I think it was really inspiring to all of the people here, and I just want to thank you for that, first and foremost. Okay. Um, my question to you is, um, I heard you mention much about uh, poor people, working class people, and um, obviously any community has those type of people, including this university right here. You know, the, the very people that make our university run, that clean the bathrooms, clean um, uh, this whole campus and make it run the way it runs. But the fact of the matter is, those isms and schisms that you talked about, racism, misogyny, sexism, they face that on a daily basis as well. And many of these workers are sisters of color. And the things that they've been going through are um, just abominable. They've seen things like um, supervisors throwing keys at them, um, being subjected to uh, racial slurs, um, being hospitalized even because their health needs are just disregarded. And this has been going on for decades and decades. And the thing is, they do all this for a wage that is not even a living wage. You know, while the football coach gets paid, paid millions and millions, they have not seen. They have not seen an increase in their wages in years while these uh, high profile administration and sports coaches see these uh, hundreds of thousand dollar bonuses. So I know that you were involved with the Harvard uh, living wage campaign. Is that correct? Absolutely. Right. So um, as someone that has a lot of experience with that, um, I want to ask you um, for some advice. What would you, um, how would you uh, approach the administration of this campus right here about that issue 
and what do you think people in this room and on this campus can do about the abuse of workers that has literally filled a 56-page report, which I'm, uh, ha which I'm holding right here and would love to give you after this meeting. Uh, what do you think, how could we approach the administration and deal with that issue? Oh, wonderful, wonderful question, though, brother. Very important. Very important. Very important. Definitely. Definitely. No, we have got to love our brothers and sisters, but disproportionately sisters who are struggling under such conditions, which means we must support them. I mean, I was blessed to actually be the first Yale professor to ever get arrested on Yale property and go to jail because of the attempt to organized clerical workers who were disproportionately women, disproportionately black and brown at Yale. That was 1984. It was 1984. Now, of course, it's difficult for me to make any kind of concrete judgment because I don't understand all the different contexts in which particular groups you have here, but I think there's certain basic steps. One is you come together, have public forums, and allow the larger community to see the beauty and the dignity of the workers that we're talking about because they speak for themselves as well as you all as students and faculty and staff alongside them. So you then get a unity of the concophony of voices. Then you begin to put pressure on. And you say, can in fact we engage in forms of negotiation where they are treated with dignity in terms of wage and benefit and so on? And you wait and see what the response is. As I said, it's improvisational. I don't know Brother Walter Lowe. I'm praying for him because he's head of the, org of the institution. But he's got a lot coming at him. I don't know what the faculty political consciousness is in terms of leadership, you see. But you put the pressure on. Now, we reached the point at Yale where we had to go on strike. And a number of us went to jail. Now, that's moving pretty far, especially for seniors who want to graduate on May 19th. <laughs> <laughs> but the important thing is you have to have that kind of commitment. That's one reason why I pointed out Brother Solomon, because he's got that kind of commitment. Is that right? Is that right? Brother Solomon got that kind of commitment. He does. I can feel it. I can feel it. But I can't make any judgment because it would be arrogant of me just coming in from the outside not knowing what's happening on the ground. You all know much more than I do, but I know there's basic stages that you have to go through. But part of the renaissance of care and concern is put forward eloquently by what you said, though, brother. You want to say it? Come right back. Just briefly. Thank you, Brother West. I'd appreciate mm -hmm. if you could take a look at the report and oh, yeah, you know, see I, for I, I yourself. But thank you again very much for coming out. Appreciate it. Oh, I'm over here. Yes. Good evening, um, Good to see Brother you. West. Good to so see you. you advocate a lot about vo for voices for social change. Yes. Except, unfortunately, sometimes a collective effort of voices can't really go very far. Certainly. The whole, um, you know, civil rights movement was not, the civil rights issues, they were not remedied through voices, they were remedied through actions. So I was just asking, what are some of your actions for social change that you prescribe to us? And also, um, you mentioned that there are a lot of problems in our society. We have like the male dominance problem, we have um, social class problem, corporate greed and stuff, except the problem is that not all of us um, care so much about each individual problem. Our attentions are kind of fragmented into yeah. all of these different issues. So how do we deal with all of these social issues that we're facing today and what can we do to not only voice our concern but also act on it to improve our mm. society? Yeah, I appreciate that question though, brother. One is though it's very important to accent words. Words create world. You know, when Shelley says in the great revolutionary pamphlet for defense of poetry, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Because you have to have vision. You have to have voices around which to organize and mobilize. And by poets, he's not talking about versifiers. He's talking about those who have courage to imagine a better world than the one in which we live. So yes, you're right. We need action. But you see, lifting your voice is an action. We just need other kinds of action alongside it with strategies and tactics, but it has to be informed by the vision and viewpoints and voices that we have. So that I do want to accent how central voices are. You see. 
But in addition, we want actions, other kinds of action. And as I said before, it, it, in this context, it's very difficult. In this larger context of America and the world, we have to be parts of organizations. An unorganized agent of social change is a contradiction in terms. You have to be part of some organization. And it could be an organization around housing, it could be an organization against patriarchal violence, it could be an organization against hatred of Jews or Arabs and so forth, it could be an organization anti-racist, could be organizations in the trade union with class and so forth and so on. Uh, and, and that's a choice one has to make. I would like to see a connection between a critique of U.S. foreign policy and organizing of poor people. But that's a kind of extension of what Martin Luther King was trying to do in the 60s. So. But the kinds of actions we're talking about is bringing pressure to bear. It could be within the electoral political system and see what possibilities we have. Thank God for the Bernie Sanders and others who are trying within the system to keep alive some larger vision of justice. Or it could be against the system on the outside in the name of reform, radical reform. Now see, I'm a revolutionary Christian, which means I'm a Jesus-loving free black man. And what that means is, is that one moment you might see me working with a Bernie Sanders on the inside, and the next moment you see me getting arrested in front of the Supreme Court. Because it's free enough to move inside and outside. Put pressure on those inside, very critical of those inside, but also support those inside who are trying to create space. There's various kind of policies. In the, in, in the other day, I was so glad to see uh, the, uh, President Obama, my dear brother Barack Obama, Mama talk about pre-K care. That's very important. I was glad to see him talk about minimum wage. We've been trying to get him to talk about minimum wage for the last four years, Ralph Nader and Jesse Jackson Jr. and others. He promised $9.50 in 2008. Now it's $9. Okay, that's not, not as much, but at least that's a movement. That's very important. That particular element of the, 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 the State of the Union, I'm talking about State of the Union, rather not State of the Union. I say yes, but I connect it with much more deeper forms of structural social change that he does not, because he's not a revolutionary Christian. He's head of the American Empire. There's a difference. Oh, there's a difference, but he's still a human being. He is to be protected, respected, but deeply corrected. Deeply corrected as a form of love. Thank yes, you. Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. West. How you doing, my brother? Pretty good. Uh, kind of nervous. I kind of idolized you a little bit. Oh, you take your time. You take your time. <laughs> All right. Um, on the day of the uh, State of the Union, we had uh, attention on one of the most hated publicly black men in America and one of the most beloved black men in America. Um, under the assumption that you've read the Dorner Manifesto, uh, I know I've had a, a lot of discussions with me and some of my peers, mm -hmm. and we can't really shake the thought that, you know, we're, we're kind of, even though he's kind of extreme, that, you know, we kind of support what he's, what he's doing because we can all relate to it on a, on a certain level. I, I wanted to, know what your opinion of what exactly it is that, because I'm, I'm not exactly sure what it is that he's trying to do. I assume that he's, he's trying to create some level of justice, as you spoke earlier. Uh, I, I just wanted to know your, your opinion on, on that current mm -hmm. event. Oh, I appreciate that question, though, brother. Appreciate the question. Definitely. And it's good to have this kind of discussion among the younger brothers and sisters and so on. But I mean, one, we begin with the notion that the killing of an innocent person is a crime against humanity. A crime against humanity. So all of us agree, I think, to say, okay, before we move into a discussion, the brothers shouldn't have been killing innocent people. Is that, you know, see what I mean? Let's just start right there. Okay, that's fine. Then we move on to say, now what was he upset about? Corruption and racism in the police department in Los Angeles. That's a serious issue. Arbitrary policing, which has a long history, of not just poor people, but especially black and brown people. Unfair, capricious, and ought to have no role whatsoever in anybody's commitment to democracy. The very end and aim of democracy is to curtail 
arbitrary rule of law. And he was then concerned about an issue that is fundamental. Why? Because racism and corruption is not confined to the Los Angeles Police Department. It's in New York. But stop and frisk. 750,000 young black and brown men stopped every year, 1900 every day. We went to jail over this. It's arbitrary. 2% of them tied to crimes. 2%. We had brothers 21 years old been stopped and frisked 16 times. That's too arbitrary, you see. That's what that brother was concerned about. How do we accent that issue without getting into the other sides of this brother's life that was tied to in killing innocent people? He reached a point where the racism in the police department seems to have led him to snap. He just couldn't take it any longer. That particular issue needs serious attention, even as we critique killing innocent people. And of course, we think of other examples. John Brown, John Brown is one of the great freedom fighters of, of America. But he killed some innocent white brothers and sisters, including innocent children. That's wrong. That for me is a crime against humanity. You can critique white supremacist slavery without killing white kids. But John Brown's spirit continues to hover over this country because he had a deep love for black people. In fact, he's a white brother who loved black people more than many black people loved themselves. He died for black people. So we, with John Brown, you make the distinction. Killing innocent folks, wrong. But he did it for the love of black folk. Now, of course, this brother Dorner, he is no. John Brown, at all. But he was a deeply damaged and a deeply scarred brother who decided to engage in gangster behavior. But we ought not to allow that gangster behavior to obscure the issue that pushed him over the brink, which is white supremacist legacy still at work in police departments that disproportionately target black and brown Young people, and I, I want to accent the issue of class here, because you see there is a strong uh, tendency in the black community to downplay class. And everybody knows that if black middle class youth were being abused by the police and going to jail at the same level as black poor youth, we'd have different kind of black leadership. And each one of them are precious. I mean, sorry, I'm objecting, but I, I yes. feel though, as in this DC area, yeah. we do we have a lot of that. PG County, up until recently, was the richest black county in America. Mm. And then you have uh, impoverished areas such as Southeast. And I'm not exactly sure what you mean by having different a different type of government when we have these two different aspects of the black community so close together. Oh, you mean with the middle class and the poor? Yeah. I mean, oh. I, I'm i from Charles County. Yes. But, I mean, I, everyone in Charles County, PG County, when I was growing up, it's, it's all middle class. And then when I moved to Oxon Hill, the southeast area, all of these uh, colored people yeah. are yeah. living in poverty. Um, broke college student. I had, you know, couldn't afford living anywhere else. Right, right. So... When you have these two different uh, types of, of relationships with black people so close together, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by the, the government or the, the politics behaving in a different way. Oh, I see. I'm glad you asked the question. I mean, one, I'd have to ask you a question. Uh, if Prince George County uh, in the last, let's say, 20 to 30 years is primarily black middle class, and then let's say a black poor community, what people call a hood these days, would the black middle class youth in Prince George County be going to jail, incarcerated at the same level as the precious black poor youth in the hood? Both youth pre pressures, but my hypothesis is, this is why I might be wrong, my hypothesis is that the black poor in the hood are going to jail with a level of intensity that the black middle class youth are not. Is that true? I, I don't think so because one thing that I've noticed is, is uh -huh. due to the 
the relationship of the black community here because, you know, these, these are my peers. Sure. I know a lot of guys whose parents, you know, they have nice government jobs, but right. because you have this relationship that's so close-knit, Southeast and, and PG County, a lot of these guys, you know, they have parents with money, but because their parents are giving them all this money, now they got some money to go play in the drug market or, or you know, uh, take their knowledge from being a little bit more privileged and try and uh, manipulate of uh, the system a little bit more. So they're getting incarcerated for the exact same things. I have a friend that just got finished doing a five year bid uh, and has two felonies on his record now. And uh, his mother and his father both work government jobs. I'm talking about, this is probably when, when I'm doing the math because I come from the same type of family. We're talking about over a quarter million dollars a year in annual revenue for his family. But because he has ties to Southeast or his uncle lives here or is doing that and the th this, that, and the third, he's doing the same things that these people are, these people that are in the hood are doing. Yeah, no, no, I hear, and I, and I appreciate the force and power of your story, but I would say this, my brother, that I think when we actually have a statistical analysis of those who are in prison, I have been blessed to teach in prisons for 32 years, and I see the wave of folk coming in, a statistical analysis would show that the vast majority of black people who are incarcerated come from poor communities. You see what I mean? That doesn't downplay the power of your story, because of course you're going to get a number of black middle class folk there. But in terms of numbers around the nation, incarceration, as I said, is very much a class of incarceration in terms of disproportionate number of poor. And that's true for white and brown, as well as black. But it could be the case, maybe th th there's some differences here in Prince George County that I don't know about. But we'd have to, we'd have to, we'd have to have some coffee over that thing. We'd, we'd have, we'd have, it was so good to see you, so good to see you. Yeah, go right ahead. Brother West, my name is Mason Trappio. How you doing, I uh, want to share with you a little metaphor that I had. Because uh, first I want to attest to your story of success is not enough. I just graduated from the University of Maryland in, in the summer. Yeah. And I got a full-time job in the animal science department. And I was mobbing the lab. Right. Thank you. Thank no, you no, much. indeed. No, we salute you. Salute you. you um, I was mobbing the lab one day. And uh, yeah, we want to make sure that we hear you, though, brother. And underneath the uh, minus 80 degrees Celsius freezer, I found a brain in a uh, 1.7 millimeter microcentrifuge tube. And I said to myself that that can't be me. You know, mm. and that that can't be anybody else in this room, just because nobody has the same experience as I do or the daily day monotony of pipetting all day long means that that amount of money that I make every two weeks is still not enough to rise myself and everybody else in this room and everybody else that's below me, everybody else that's living on Du Bois Place where my grandma lives out in Southeast. Excuse me, I'm sick. It's not enough, you know, and so. I wrote a story for you that contains more metaphors. I got these all over the place, but my main concern is a lot of people, like myself, after we leave this room, will then resort to their form of relaxation, entertainment. And having done a lot of comedy within the area, it's I still, it's really base. And uh, I'm just trying to understand how with that avenue, which is so powerful, you know, we got projectors in the basement of Stamp in this very building and two in this room, you know, and we've got movies all over the place. How do we transcend this, uh, you know, like, you know, much respect to the Wayans brothers, but, you know, Marlon's coming out with this movie that he said, quote, it was paranormal blacktivity, right? Which is not mm. progress, mm -hmm. it's cash in his pocket. And so I'm trying to understand how do I not make the same mistake that he has done? while not also going crazy like what happened to Dave Chappelle. I appreciate that question. No. no, I was just with Dave Chappelle a couple of weeks ago, and he's in his right mind, though, brother. He, no, 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 I totally he's in his right that. mind. I totally though. understand that. But, but, but he, he didn't want to be seduced by the rule of money. That's what I'm saying. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So your definition of crazy is having integrity? Exactly. Oh, oh okay. No, no, well, no, I mean, because no, I, because I mean, because I'm worried about that, you know, because oh, I would go, are. I would go and, and do these open mics and stuff like that, and we I see, are. you know, all these people talking about that, you know, the mahogany cards that Hallmark makes that they're sub racist, but I'm like, you know what? The other cards don't even speak for us, right. so you can't say that those ones 
or you know minstrel showy or whatever because right. those same red and white cards don't work the same as a brown gold and green ones that are you know yeah. you know what i'm saying yeah. and so yeah. i'm just i'm struggling with this as i have been struggling with throughout my comedy career at the university of maryland and and so on it's just like how do how do we make sure that entertainment doesn't just turn into numbness and how does it right. you know turn right. into subversive education like what yes. you're talking about. Absolutely. No, that's a powerful question, though, brother. One is that um, going all the way back to Aristophanes, comedy and comic artists oftentimes are the freest persons in the society in which they live. That's why Richard Pryor was probably one of the most freest black men in the 20th century. He had the courage and the genius to lift his fearless voice and tell truths that the politicians couldn't tell, that a lot of black leaders couldn't tell. But he did it in such a way that it humanized others because it allowed them to laugh. You see, Moms Mabley was like that. Godfrey, Godfrey Cambridge was like that. Dick Gregory is one of the great geniuses of what I'm talking about, you see. Lenny Bruce, George Carlin, was that that brother's name? Genius, unbelievable. Part of the problem is in a society under the rule of money, you make more money laughing at people than laughing with people. Richard Pryor never laughed at black people. He laughed with black people. Mulebone, one of the great characters in the history of comedy in the modern world, was Richard Pryor in the context of, Pre of, 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 of Peoria, Illinois, an extension of him laughing at himself, allowing him to laugh with other folk, beginning with black folk, but then spilling over beyond the chocolate side of town to other parts of town as well, affecting humanity. It's, and when David Chappelle and I have our dialogues, that's precisely what we talk about. How do you walk this tightrope between big money and integrity and being true to you, not just true to yourself, true to the traditions of the Richard Pryors and the Moms Mabley's and, and Dick Greg's, Gregory's and others. You see. And uh, um, thank God yourself, and I know you wrestle with other comic uh, artists yourself, trying to stay tied to that tradition in the same way I try to stay tied to it as a writer. With Du Bois and James Baldwin and Audre Lorde and Toni Morrison and Lorraine Hansberry and others. And it is a very difficult thing. We need each other to keep each other accountable in that way, in that way. Thank you so much. I do want to take a moment. Could, could the, all of the members of the W. E. Du Bois Honor Society please stand? Please stand. Give, give them a hand. Give them a hand. W. B. Du Bois Honor Society. Brilliant, brilliant folk building on that rich legacy. Building on that rich legacy. I think we got one more question, right? How you doing, Dr. West? Good to see you, though. What is that? Murder by television. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, so I had a question, I guess it's based on Islamophobia. I'm a member of the Muslim community, and um, I noticed that with every single group that has come to this country, whether it be like the Irish or the Italians, they've all been subjugated by the majority that's been in this country, and now it's our turn. Um, and so I was wondering, like, I don't really accept the fact that whoever, like, the new kid is at that time in the century is just going to have to be subjected to harsh treatment. So is there anything that the people in this room can start to do or the people of this generation can start to do to make sure that that doesn't happen in the future or are we just doomed to an American history where that's all that's in the textbooks? Thank you. Wow, appreciate it. Appreciate it though, brother. Appreciate it. Well, one thing to keep in mind, we're never doomed to anything. Never. You can change. You can fight. You can love. You can laugh. Sometimes all you can do, sing a song. But a song of despair is not despair. To sing the blues is not to allow the blues to take over. When B.B. King says, nobody loves me but my mama, she might be jiving too. He does it with tremendous spirit and style and a little help from Lucille. So the last word is dignity. The last word is defiance. The last word is straighten one's back up. So that American history has been at its worst a cycle. Our Catholic brothers and sisters, this 
mistreated by the Protestants. Indigenous peoples and black folk already subjugated. Women already dominated. But then here come the Eastern European Jews, where the Catholics and the Protestants get together against them, Christians against Jews. Asians, and they, Asians, of course, build a railroad along with the Irish, but then excluded, deported. Right? That's the worst. That's the cycle. The question is, how do you break that cycle? We're not doomed to that cycle, but it is a strong and, in some ways, at our worst, a dominant cycle. Voices of social change say, no, we, it, it can be different. It can be different. If we're strong enough, if we have enough strength and fortitude, we don't have to allow that cycle. So you're absolutely right with our Muslim brothers and sisters and Arab brothers and sisters. Right now, especially since 9-11, it's an uphill battle. And we look back. What did the prophetic Protestants do when the Irish were mistreated? Through my own seminary, Union Theological Seminary. Ryan Ho Niebuhr's and others, they said, I am Irish. You say, well, you don't look Irish. I'm Irish in the metaphoric sense. I stand with the Irish even though I'm Protestant. I stand with the Jews against anti-Semitism. After 9-11, I am a Muslim. Brother West, you just told us you're a Christian. My point is, I'm a Muslim as a Christian. See what I mean? I'm in solidarity to ensure that those who are being mistreated are not rendered invisible. And you had white folk do the same thing to black folk all through the best of the history of white brothers and sisters in this country. And you had folk doing it with Latinos. I am Latino, but your last name was McGillicuddy. That's right. It's war ass from now on. Human solidarity, taking a stand. And I do think that, uh, I, I do think that we, 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 we have a chance of, of, ha of making some significant impact when it comes to the uh, vicious perceptions and treatment of uh, Islamic brothers and sisters and Arab brothers and sisters and so forth, you see. Because I can, I, I, as part of uh, different groups of coming together in the last 10 years or so, there's been some kind of movement and that's been encouraging. But sometimes it's, I mean, it's always too slow, right? And there we have a revolutionary patience, which is to say we're continually dissatisfied no matter what, because we can keep track of the progress. But as Malcolm X says, folks stab me in the back nine inches, pull it out six inches, you don't just celebrate the progress. You got work to do. Thank you all so very much. Stay strong in your work. <laughs>